Before we kick off the show, if you're a fan of History Hack, please do what you can to support the show. We completely get that not everyone is able or willing to dig into their pockets. Times are hard, but by dropping a like, subscribing on Twitter and YouTube, and importantly, leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts, you can help the program grow and reach more people. If you're interested in becoming a supporter, go to patreon.com forward slash history hack, where you'll find perks from secret Facebook groups to early release material. If you just want to leave us a one-off tip, go to co-fee.com forward slash history hack. The links are in the description. And whatever form your kind support takes, know that we are massively grateful. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I've got Kit with me today, joining me from, I'm not entirely sure where you are now, Kit, somewhere in South America. How are you doing? Where have you got to? I am in Bogota in uh, Colombia this morning. (laughs) Very nice. We're going to talk about a topic that's a long way from Colombia. Let's be honest. Introduce our guest for us. So we're very excited today. We have got Tony Mount. She is a member of the Richard III Society's Research Committee, a master's graduate in medieval medicine, and the author of How to Survive in Medieval England. Now, I really love this approach because you put it together almost like a travel guide, um, the book. Um, Tony, what made you want to write it in this format? Uh, Well, it wasn't my idea. I have to confess, the publisher's pen and sword have already got a series going called How to Survive. Um, They've done Romans and a couple of others, but they asked me to write the medieval equivalent. Well, I knew that um, people had written time travellers' guides and all that sort of thing. Um, But I wanted mine to be different. So I aimed it at people who were interested in history, but were in no way academic. And I thought, um, I began my writing by thinking about how different it would be for young people from the 21st century if they went back in time they'd suddenly find themselves without social media uh, sat nabs mobile phones can't look anything up on google so i wrote my book as um, the layman's version of google for the uh, middle ages so that was how I pitched it. I think that comes across really well. It's a really nice, really readable book, which I think is often important when you're trying to do something like this and kind of immerse your reader in a very different world. It goes back to that thing about, you know, to what extent is the past a foreign country? Well, it sort of isn't, but actually in some respects, culturally and, and in terms of how things work, in many respects it is. So. The way we were thinking of doing this one was to kind of dip in and out of the book and give people a flavour of what's covered, because you cover a huge range of things. So let's start with religion. What am I expected to think and do when it comes to God during this period? Well, you haven't got much choice about whether you believe in God or not. Um, Everybody believed uh, that God had created the world. And in fact, it was God's decision where you were in that world, whether you were a rich man or a poor man, a king or a peasant, um, that was God's decision. Also, you didn't have a choice of religion in Western Europe. You were Roman Catholic with all that that entailed, allegiance to the Pope, all the services, um, the Bible, any religious books, all written in Latin. So one thing I advise um, any would-be traveller going back to medieval times is to learn a bit of Latin, in particular, the Lord's Prayer, the Pater Nostra. If you can recite that in Latin, 
Uh, you'll be seen as uh, a good Christian. So that's your um, entry point, if you like. Um, so I, the one question I, I did have was um, about uh, Judaism, because we know that that did exist in the early half of the medieval period. And I think it's Edward I who actually expels the Jews from, uh, from England. Yes. Um, so was being Jewish an option? Not if you're in England. Uh, as you say, the Jews are expelled, I think it's in the 1290s by Edward I. Uh, he saw that as a brilliant way of making money. The King of France had already done it. And in expelling all the Jews who um, made a lot of profit from money lending, the King actually took upon himself all the money owed to the Jews was now to go to the crowd. So it was a money-making effort. And it's not until Oliver Cromwell's in charge in the 1650s that part of his policy of um, free religious choice for all that he actually opens England up again to the Jews. Um, there were a few Jews in England throughout the Middle Ages, but um, they had to be very secretive about it and generally be hanged as though they were Christian converts, even if it really hadn't happened. They had to be what we call converts, something that you'd converted to Christianity. And as long as they kept up that pretense, they could get away with it. But there were very, very few in England. And supposing that you don't conform, I mean, you talk about how there are folks, Jews, who pretend to have converted, but they don't, you know, they, they carry that on in secret. If you're not willing to conform, what happens then? What, what would happen to me as somebody who, you know, refuses to, to bother with the Latin because of, you know, mere scars oh, from yes. school um, and, and, and just refuses to, to toe the line when it comes to religion? Well, that's, um, that becomes um, a possibility in England from about um, 1360 to 1380. You've got John Wycliffe, an Oxford professor who is secretly transcribing and translating the Latin Bible into English. Um, for a start, he's sort of treated as, oh, let him get on with it, you know, he's just a silly man. But gradually people get hear of it and like the idea. In fact, John Gaunt was one of his early supporters, although he later changed his mind. Now, this whole group of people who think that um, having the Bible in English at least is a brilliant idea are called Lollards. And they gradually become quite a powerful group. Um, they reach their zenith, perhaps, um, around the reign of Henry V. So that's uh, 14, 13, 14, 22, something like that. I can't remember the exact date. But um, there are a whole bunch of lot of particularly in East Anglia and Kent. Um, and they become troublesome. The church starts to take steps against it. And in fact, Henry V himself is very anti lollard to the point where one of his old friends, Sir John Oldcastle, who's a very enthusiastic lollard, is actually burnt at the stake. And Henry signs the death for his old friend. That's how zealous Henry is in trying to get rid of them. Um, so you can be a Lollard, but after Henry V's reign, the Lollards go quiet. 
they still exist, but uh, they keep well under the radar because um, you're guilty of heresy if you don't toe the line, which can end up as a burning at the stake. Nobody wants that. No, no, indeed. Um, <laughs> let's lighten the mood a little bit. Um, let's talk about food, which is one of my favourite subjects. Um, you mentioned in the book that dieting is basically out of the question because you're burning around 5,000 calories a day through labour yes. and trying to stay warm. Yes. So what would I be eating to give myself a fighting chance and how does it vary between the rich and the poor? Well, the poor can't be choosy. Um, if it comes your way, eat it. Um, I mean, they used to... Uh, trawl through the hedgerows for stuff we would consider weeds but almost anything that wasn't literally poisonous could go into the pot um, and be boiled up to bulk out what was basically porridge oats that was the poor man's um, food stuff he might get cheese he might, on rare occasions, have bacon or something, but really it was almost a vegetarian diet. And if um, the harvest had been poor, then malnutrition the following spring was uh, a real possibility. But if you were rich, then um, it was no whole spot on the food. Meat as often as you could get it, except on fast days when you'd have fish, cheese, bacon, um, these sort of um, game birds, venison, wild boar, you name it, it was available if you could afford it. Plus all the um, additional flavourings, the exotic foreign spices, um, sugar, sugar and pepper were the status symbols. So whatever you had as a rich person, you put sugar and pepper on it, no matter how ridiculous. They, they would sugarcoat the joint of bulk because, um, you know, that would show how rich they were. So. Well, in fairness, McDonald's do that today. Um, <laughs> how um, how wide, you mentioned malnutrition, how widespread was uh, malnutrition, and malnutrition and famines? Were there cases of you know, pe people, mass deaths, things like that? Um, certainly there were certain periods. Um, a particularly bad period was the 1300s. Um, up to, I think, 1317 was the worst year. But there were failed harvests throughout Europe, which meant we couldn't import grain um, either. We couldn't grow it ourselves. The summers had been cold and wet. Um, and people were actually eating the seed corn from last year because there was nothing else, which meant the following year there was not much to plant. Um, so starvation across Europe into the 1320s, which actually led to an enfeebled population by the time we get to 1347, when the plague starts to sweep across Europe. But Every year there are signs that the population of the poor was tending to suffer from um, scurvy to a degree, especially through the spring when all last year's vegetables were, even if they'd been stored, their vitamin C levels were deterioration and the new crop still had to come in. So signs of scurvy was almost an annual uh, problem, plus other um, malnutrition um, diseases like rickets and things like that. 
Um, and it was actually recognised by the church so that they tried to insist that mothers should breastfeed their babies to make sure, um, you know, the baby got the best chance from uh, decent breast milk, whereas the rich tended to think that that was, uh, they didn't have time for that, so they would tend to employ wet nurses, which uh, were never quite as good. As you say, this this must have been an endemic problem throughout society. You know, it's it's only in the last sort of two, three hundred years that we've had a proper understanding or a growing understanding, yes. at the very least, of nutrition and, and these kinds of issues, which then leads us into questions of life expectancy. So if I'm out there, OK, so this isn't a perfect example, because, you know, having been brought up on a 21st century diet, I'm healthier than the most people would have been back then. But you know, if you're born into this system, how long have you got? And, and what's what's going to kill me? Is it going to be the malnutrition? Is it going to be disease? Is it going to be lack of sanitation? What, what What's the risks? Well, obviously, any of those things could be fatal if you're unlucky. But um, when you look at the figures, for life expectancy, you get something awful like um, you're not expected to live beyond your 30s. But the figures are heavily skewed because children died, um, up to 50% of children died before they were five. If you managed to reach your teens, then you had a better chance um, of getting on. In fact, um, dates of death, if you like, the ages at which you died varied. Uh, young men were always at risk because young men can be reckless. They're the ones that go to war, perhaps with the least experience, Plus the sort of jobs that men do, thatching roofs or um, working as stonemason or working with heavy animals, all those things could lead to accidents. For women, the um, biggest cause of death is sort of from their late teens to their mid-thirties, childbirth is the biggest killer for young women, apart from accidents in the home with the fires, cauldrons and boiling water, all this sort of thing could all uh, cause death. However, if you made it into your forties, men were not scared to go to war perhaps by that age, women were coming to the end of their childbearing years, you actually had a good chance of living into your 60s. Um, and if you were in the church, in other words, a man who did not go to war probably had a decent menu, and or a woman who is a nun who never had children, you actually had a good chance of getting into your 80s. The records for um, elderly abbots and abbesses is uh, quite high. So, um, yeah, life expectancy for an individual who is lucky, probably 75, you know, they would reach their three score years and 10 and perhaps a bit more or so. Yeah. And you were talking about childbirth. What are the what is the kind of process behind childbirth? Because this changes a lot as we go through different periods. So there, there is a phase, I believe, during the Tudors where they kind of they black out the rooms um, to try and sort of yeah. prevent any kind of intrusion of I'm, I'm not entirely sure quite what I suspect it might be evil spirits or something. What's what's the thinking when we go back to the medieval period around childbirth? Is it, you know, you're on your own, get on with it, or are there prayers that are said, uh, how does it work? Yeah, well, uh, for your 
average um, misses. Um, I mean, you'd probably be out working in the field till the last possible minute or down the market selling your butter and cheese to the last minute possible. Hopefully get home, call the midwife. You'd sit on a special birthing stool, which is actually a chair with the arms, quite a stoutly built chair with part of the bottom of it cut out so that gravity could help the baby come out. Um, and then as soon as you could possibly get up and walk around, you'd be back to work. But if you were a lady, well, especially royalty, there was a whole palaver to it. Um, that you would retire about a month before you thought the baby was due. And you might stay in bed for six weeks after it was born. You'd really milk it for all it was worth. The idea of uh, shutting the room and uh, having a fire light even in midsummer, making it really hot and moist was that it was thought it would be less of a shock for the baby. That the baby was coming from darkness, warmth and moisture. And the more you could make the room like the womb, the better chance it had of surviving. So that was part of the reason. But of course, um, death and child birth complications uh, went right across the scale. We know from uh, Henry VIII's writing, which is a bit outside the time period, but Jane Seymour must have had the best that uh, medicine of the day could possibly manage when she gave birth to uh, Prince Edward but she still died of childbirth complications. And Henry's last queen, Catherine Parr, remarried after the king died. And within a year, she was dead of childbirth complications. So, um, yeah, it really has this time for, for women. And hazardous time for everyone. Um, if you get ill, you're in serious trouble because the medicine you're relying on is is essentially Galen, um, which was thousands of years earlier, or well, thousand years earlier, and the the, the idea of humours, um, and he was also obsessed with wombs. Um, so how do you get treated in medieval England? Well, um, personally, I needed help. I think I would go to a barber surgeon rather than a physician. The physician is far more likely to read my horoscope. And only if my horoscope looks favourable will he even bother to look at me. On the other hand, his idea of treatment is to treat the whole body. It's a holistic approach. So they would try to improve and balance your humours um, by changing your diet, um, even changing your bedroom, so that if you were suffering from too much phlegm, which often happens in the winter, you should put your bed in the room that gets the most sunshine. Um, so, you know, that, that sounds sensible. And again, for too much phlegm, you should eat a diet of hot, spicy food to dry up the excess fluid. Whereas if you've got a fever, then something like cold, wet fish diet would be prescribed. But as I was saying, something practical, an external problem in particular, and external included things like cataracts and hemorrhoids. Um, you'd go to a barber surgeon 
and they could be surprisingly skillful. Um, in the book, I actually talk about a skeleton that was discovered in a mass grave that um, contained the remains of a number of skeletons from the Battle of Tapton. They were all male. They were all aged between about 20 and 50. They were all big, hefty guys. But one of them in particular, his, he'd been knocked on the head and killed. But his skull showed signs that he'd once received a severe injury to his jaw. It actually chipped away a whole section of bone and a removed a tooth and yet the bone showed no sign of any sort of infection it had been treated the uh, sliver of bone had been removed the tooth had been removed it had been stitched up and the wound had healed well enough for him to fight again so that was down to the surgeons they also treated young Henry V. Um, we know he got um, an arrow in the cheek that went right through to the roof of his mouth. And they managed to remove that. The guy who, John Ardern, who actually did the surgery, wrote about it in a book which was published so that other surgeons could follow his instructions. Um, and we know Henry V lived long enough to be the picture of Agincourt and all of that. So, um, yeah, surgeons could be pretty clever. Yeah, and as you say, I suppose royalty, they get the best surgeons. Warfare is often said to yeah. kind of attract the best of medicine, partly because, you know, people having to, to practice these yeah, all advances, advances, medicine, because you've got all those wounded soldiers to try things out of, and you might discover something that works. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, we so, know that happened later on. A Frenchman called Ambrose Poiret, just in the 16th century, um, was supposed to be dealing with wounded soldiers but he was the new surgeon and he actually ran out of um, hot oil which is how they cauterize wounds and he didn't want to go and complain because he was new so he improvised and actually found that his treatment was more efficient than what had um, than the slapping boiling oil on the wound to cauterize it so um, that's how it works so what was he doing differently he did quite tried quite a few different things he made up a mixture which i know contained turpentine which acts as a brilliant antiseptic and he discovered that that worked a lot lot more efficiently so he also came up with new treatment for burns, which was onion skins, which apparently do work. And he got the idea from a wise woman, some old woman he met who he said, he went to the apothecary and said, this Lord so-and-so has just had gunpowder blow up in his face, his face is a terrible mess. And what, what have you got anything I can use? And the apothecary came up with a long list, but the old woman in the queue behind him said, No, don't use any of that, slap onion skins on it. So he did, and he actually did one side of the Lord's face with onion skins, and the other side with some traditional treatment. And the onion skins um, healed with very little scarring and much more efficiently than the other side. Let's talk about the other senses. 
we talked about taste and feeling ill, but what about things like smells and sounds and so on? What what could we expect? Uh, smells probably top of the list. Everything will be smelly. Um, I mean, we think, you know, there'll be no pollution, rivers will be clean, it's all going to be lovely. But um, in houses, there's no proper sanitation. Uh, people do wash, I have to stress that. They're most particular every morning. Because of your religion, you were expected to say morning prayers. And rather like the Muslims today, who are expected to wash before prayers, um, you were expected to wash your hands, face, and probably your feet um, before you uh, went to morning prayers. God didn't want to see you all dirty and smelly. Um, but, you know, waste disposal was... Uh, chuck it in the street um that sort of thing so nowhere smelled lovely but i think as a visitor after you got over the initial shock and after you become as smelly as the rest of the population you probably won't notice it too much but they do try to stay clean um, it's also going to be quite noisy. Life is regulated by bells. And it's, it's actually recorded in places that you could hear London before you could see it because of the chiming of so many parish church bells, uh, particularly on a Sunday. And the bells actually regulated your life it was the way medieval people told the time there would be um, a bell at 6 a.m when you were expected to get up and say your first lot of prayers although in summer you've probably already been up long since and working uh, then there'd be a midday bell which a lot of people took as dinner time. But again, more prayers. You were supposed to say the Angelus, which just a short prayer, which began, uh, the angel said to Mary, blessed art thou amongst women. That was your prayer. But the first word in Latin is Angelus. So there was the 6 a.m. Angelus, the midday one, and then one at 6 p.m. when you could knock off work if you could afford it or if it was too dark to see anymore. Plus extra bells for the opening and closing of the market. You weren't supposed to trade until the bell had rung. Um, and the abbeys and priories would have bells ringing at least at every three hours throughout the day. So noisy and bustling and busy. And you know, you'd have uh, iron shod horses and iron shod wheels and all that sort of thing. People shouting out what they got to sell. Get out of the way because the king's coming and trumpets and just about everything was noisy. So no noise abatement societies. It sounds pretty chaotic, and that's the perfect uh, recipe, if you like, for doing a bit of crime. Um, so if I was a naughty boy and I did something illegal, um, who's coming after me? Are there police? Well, that depends where you are, really. Um, a lot of policing was down to neighbourhood watch. Um, if you saw a crime committed, you were duty bound to do what they called raise a hue and cry, which literally meant make a lot of noise call everybody's attention to it, blow a horn, bang on doors, clatter pots and pads, 
um, to let everybody know that a crime had been committed. And anyone who was fit and able and heard this hue and cry was uh, obliged to take part in the pursuit of the criminal. Um, if they didn't, they could actually be arrested as having been an accessory to the crime because they hadn't tried to stop the perpetrator escaping. On the other hand, if you did it just for a bit of fun, you could be fighting sixpence for raising the hue and cry unless felony. But out in the countryside, it really was down to a bit of luck and somebody saw crime being committed. But in London, each ward had a guy called a beadle. He was known as the Alderman's Watchdog. He was the brains behind policing the ward, which might only be a couple of parishes, or it could have been a bigger area. He'd have a couple of constables underneath him. And it was actually his duty, the Beadle's duty, to list any known felons in the ward, um, any loose women behaving immorally, uh, any, you know, sort of dodgy characters. He was supposed to report them monthly to the alderman of the ward, who was then supposed to act on that information within 15 days. Um, so, also in London, there would be the night watch for each ward. They would be appointed by the beadle. And if you were out and about after dark without carrying a flaming torch to illuminate your way, you were automatically considered to be up to no good and could be arrested. Um, there was also in London the marching watch because obviously if you got to the ward boundary as a criminal and hopped over into the next street, the ward watch couldn't touch you. But the marching watch had jurisdiction throughout the city so they could cross the boundaries and arrest the perpetrator. Wow, um, you better watch out if Beatles about, I guess. Oh, um, yes. And, and if I am caught, um, uh, what's, what are my options in terms of, uh, of trying to convince people I'm innocent? Or if I am innocent, how do I prove it? Um, if you are innocent, your best hope is to get as many influential oath helpers. Now, an oath helper is supposed to be someone who has known you for at least three years, but they mustn't be a family member or relative. They are supposed to come forward and swear on the Holy Bible that you are a person of such, um, such a Christian person and, and so responsible that you would never have committed such a dreadful deed. Um, and the more influential your oath helpers, the fewer you needed. Women were no good. Oh, you're back. Yeah, women didn't count as no helper, but if you had a Lord Mayor or a Master of the Guild or something, then um, your oaths meant more than. Uh, and you didn't need so many. You could be required to have up to two dozen oath helpers to swear to your inability to have committed that crime. But um, you were asking me earlier about benefit of clergy. And that's probably your get out of jail free card. Um, Clergymen, whatever their crimes, could only be tried in a church court. 
and a church court could fine you. They could make you do a penance. Um, they might put you in prison for a short while. That prison was expensive, so they didn't usually bother. They'd rather fine you and get the money. Um, but they could not execute you, which is brilliant news. So you had to prove that you were a member of the clergy. Didn't have to wear a cassette, didn't have to have a bishop's mitre, because even a deacon or the church clerk, church warden, all counted as um, clerical people. And all they had to do to prove that they were clerics was to be able to read. Because still, in the 16th century, they were still taking it that only churchmen were educated and could read Latin. So what they used to do was present you with a Bible, say, read that, and if you could read it, you were classed as a church person, a religious person. And the silly thing is that the verse you always had to read was the same verse every time, just a couple of lines. So it's um, a verse from Psalm 51. And all it says is something like, Lord God, please forgive me all my sins. But in Latin, of course. And if you could quote that, so long as you were looking at the book and pretending to read, you just said, spouted that. And then they said, oh, yes, right, he's a clerical gentleman, so we let him off. It's called the neck, but that's because it saves your neck. That's a staggering get out of jail free card, isn't it? Just, yeah. you know, I, I almost have visions of whatever the medieval equivalent of the Peaky Blinders might have been, setting up gangs where they're saying, look, this is all you need to do in this scenario. Just recite this and you'll be fine. That, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to have a sort of slightly self-indulgent chat about war for a moment. We love a bit of war on history hack. So what's the philosophy on how to wage war during this period? I'm guessing nobody's read Sun Tzu in medieval no. Europe. No, the uh, Warrior's Bible was a book by a Roman called Vegetius. Um, he'd compiled this really extensive encyclopedia on warfare, mainly um, for the Roman emperors whom he served as sort of financial manager. He wasn't a soldier himself, but he'd obviously studied it in detail. And I think his objective really was to make sure the emperor wasn't frittering away money um, and then losing the war because he wasn't doing it properly. So this Vegetius is day rate military, which just means about military matters. Um, that, that was the book that was still being read uh, well into the 19th century because it was so sensible, really. He sort of came up with ideas that um, drilling the soldiers, having them exercise and keep Fit. He said that was worth far more than a surgeon and a battle of medicine. So, um, and that you should always be ready for the enemy to do something you weren't expecting. And in fact, that should be what you aim to do, that the unexpected. And you know, that, that was quite a revolutionary idea um, because. In the days when you used to arrange that, okay, we'll uh, meet and do battle next week on the Wednesday at two o'clock, that sort of thing, um, to catch somebody out was, well, I suppose it wasn't really quite cricket, but then the Romans didn't play cricket, so that was, that was a good idea. 
so I mean, in terms of thinking how that influences chances of survival, I, I guess it depends which side you, you're on and which side has done the, the due diligence in, in reading this material and really absorbing it and dwelling on it. But then I'm also kind of thinking, well, if this guy's saying, ah, surgeons, don't worry about surgeons, all of this has, a, has an impact, right, on terms of your chances of survival. So talk us through it. Presumably, if you get wounded, that's, that's a problem. Um, but if you're on the side that's taking the element of surprise, then perhaps you have a reduced likelihood of being wounded in the first place. Well, yes, you do. Um, and I mean, something that the Romans didn't include, the Jetius couldn't include it in his book, uh, was the longbow. That was an invention, a weapon of mass destruction, um, on the equivalent of, um, you know, a Polaris submarine. It was really cheating. The uh, French didn't like it one little bit, you know, the English not not doing it properly. Um, so they improved their cannon, which is another thing the Jetius couldn't write about. Um, though throughout the period we're talking about cannon wasn't that devastating. It was as likely to blow up a guy firing the cannon as the people he was pointing it at. Um, in fact, one of the Scottish kings got a new toy, brand new cannon, decided he would fire it for the first time. And it was back in my knees and blew up in its face and killed it. So, um, you know, let somebody else fiddle about with the cannon, especially for the first time. So there are these revolutionary ideas gradually coming in. but. Um, I've already mentioned um, the guy who found in the chapter mass right who recovered from a horrible injury, and Henry V had also recovered from an arrow in the face. Both of them make it. It's really luck. I think, a bit like life now, it's always the luck of the draw. But um, I think you probably stand a better chance of recovering from a nasty wound as a soldier, simply because kings didn't want to lose a good soldier. So they did pay decent surgeons to do a decent job. Whereas if you were unlucky and fell off the roof whilst patching the thatch, um, you know, if you couldn't afford the best surgeon, then uh, your chances were not so good. So um, I think you stood a reasonable chance, so long as you didn't get some internal injury that they could do nothing about. But a broken leg, they knew how to set it. Um, head injuries, they knew quite a bit about. Uh, some burns, as we've heard, could be coped with. So, um, yeah, it's it's all down to luck, but you do stand a chance. So, plus you've been trained in the arts of warfare, so you'd be giving as good as you got, hopefully. <laughs> I love that description of the longbow as being the equivalent of, you know, the atomic bomb in, in yes. medieval England. Yes. I'd, I mean, I'm, I'm struck by what you say about class having a, a role to play in this, or at least status and wealth having a, a role to play with this, because presumably that translates down into the protection that you're wearing, whether or not you're, you know, you're wearing leather or metal body armour, the, the quality of that armour. You know, what, what kind of chances do you stand in terms of protection against a wound in the first place? Well, um, Henry V, the future Henry V, would have had the Ultima in uh, armour of the early 1400s. Um, and yet he raises his wives up and gets an arrow in the face. So um, even full body armour 
doesn't necessarily save you. It didn't save Richard III. He would have had top of the range bespoke armor, and it didn't save him. But people lower down would simply be wearing boiled leather, which goes very hard. But it would be lined with sheep's fleece, um, which is surprisingly good at um, sort of um, taking the impact of a blow, so long as it's not a bladed weapon. Um, people also used to have studs, you know, sort of biker jacket type studs, uh, which were very good at deflecting uh, arrows and that sort. But of course, there were special designs of arrows. A bodkin arrow was just a point. None, none of you Robin Hood um, arrows with um, barbs, just a point. And that could penetrate even armour if you were sort of too close. But um, the barbed weapons were far worse if you got them in your flesh because it is much damage coming out as it did going in unless you could knock them straight through. Um, but, you know, people couldn't always afford the best. Most people managed a helmet of some kind, um, which often the kettle helmets were worn in particular, but that you got, which were handy for turning up the other way, filling with water and boiling your dinner in. So that's why they were called kettle helmets, because <laughs> they were uh, good for cooking as well. And, uh, but they hadn't invented the tea bag, of course, so uh, not for making tea. But, you know, you could possibly afford that. There were also very small, um, sort of one-handed shields called bucklers, which again were often used as buckets for fetching water. And they could just hook on your belt when you weren't using them. And You'd literally use that um, like a boxing glove. You'd have your sword or your nasty weapon, your war hammer or whatever in one hand, and your buckle on the other hand, and you'd use it to uh, punch the guy while you were uh, stabbing it. And if you followed what was in the Jetius, he had this wonderful idea that. Everybody had to be right-handed. And you were sort of also guarding the guy to your right's left hand, and the guy to your left hand was um, guarding you as well, so that you all sort of overlapped with your pointy weapon and your buckler um, doing damage together. That was what the Anglo section would have called a shield, what was uh, pretty difficult to break through um, unless somebody turned and ran for it or uh, fell down dead or whatever. Then you know, things got, got a bit chaotic. But that, that was the basic idea. And you'd be well drilled and trained in that if you were a proper soldier. Well, we've covered war, we've covered famine, we've covered illnesses, we've covered um, horrible complications of pregnancy. Let's send on something a bit lighter. Um, yeah. Assuming that nothing bad is going on, I'm not suffering from some horrible disease or slowly dying in a war, what would I be doing with my spare time? Uh, would I be listening to the latest you know, music or what, what, what would I be getting up to? Oh, well, if you had any spare time, um, a lot of people wouldn't have had much. But, um, of course, all music is live. So, um, as you make your own, most, most people, if they weren't tone deaf, would be singing or playing an instrument of some sort. Um, and even if you were tone deaf, there were 
drums and cymbals and percussion instruments of different kinds. Um, music was everywhere. It was also used to attract attention, to advertise and that sort of thing. So there'd be a lot more music. Also, um, another good way of relaxing was storytelling. Uh, we know that um, Geoffrey Chaucer actually read the Canterbury Tales out aloud to Richard II's court to entertain them. And he read it sort of story by story uh, each day. And they'd all come along to hear the next episode. And that, that sort of thing went on. There would be street performances. Um, some, there's actually a picture in a manuscript um, that's in my new book. Um, of a woman breastfeeding a baby, carrying a pitcher of water on her head, but she's actually on stilts. So, you know, whether that was just to keep her out of a flooded area or whether she was a street former practicing in her spare time, I don't know. But acrobats, fire eaters, sword swallowers, puppet shows, um, plus lots of different sorts of plays, which had mostly started out as religious plays to enable um, the illiterate to get to know Bible stories. But things had progressed and uh, there was a whole troop um, that called mummers who would do mummers plays, which were often quite exciting. And just a group of actors would turn up outside the pub, put on a play, pass around the hat we were expected to uh, put some money in it. And these would usually be a comedy. Uh, St. George was a very uh, popular subject, but not serious Christianity diet St. George. This was George fighting the dragon and uh, rescuing a damsel in distress and usually died at some point and would be resurrected. That was a hint towards all good Christians being resurrected on the last day. Whereas the bad guy, the devil or whoever they had as the bad guy, would die and be resurrected, but at the end, he wouldn't come back to life. And that shows that good would ultimately defeat evil. And um, these sort of plays were very, very popular. So. Tony, this has been brilliant. Just kind of letting your, your knowledge of this period wash over us. Thank you so much for joining us. Your book, How to Survive in Medieval England, is out now. Folks can get it via the History Hack bookstore. And thank you once again. This has been great. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been great fun talking to you. Hello, folks. Zach again here. As you know, we love bringing you these podcasts, but each episode has a huge investment of time behind it. For every hour of showtime, there's often a good four or five or six hours of work that's going in behind the scenes. We want to bring you more content, video content even, but as reality has hit and the need to earn a living has returned, we just haven't been able to do that. That's where you come in. Your support doesn't need to be financial. You can follow us on Twitter at hack underscore history. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe on YouTube. Even simple likes, shares and retweets make a huge difference in widening our reach beyond the small army of you who tune in. And if you love the show, leave a review. If all our listeners were able to find the two minutes to do that, it would massively increase our reach. Of course, we totally get that times are hard and money is tight. If you can spare something and want to, there are different ways that you can help. If you want to become a regular supporter, check out patreon.com forward slash history hack. There are all kinds of perks across different levels of support, with prices starting at £3 a month. 
If you just want to send us a one-off tip, then visit co-fee.com forward slash history hack. The links are in the description to this episode. But importantly, also have a think about supporting our listeners. The hour they spend with us is a minuscule fraction of the time that they spend researching and writing their books. With that in mind, we set up the History Hack bookstore, where you can support both them and us instead of funding Jeff Bezos' next trip into space, which is what pretty much happens when you buy via Amazon. Again, the link is in the description, and we have a huge back catalogue of titles written by our guests. When you buy via uk.bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, we get a percentage, and so do independent booksellers. Whatever form your support takes, we massively appreciate it. So from Alex, Boney and me, and the rest of your down-the-pub regulars, thank you, and have a great day.